Thank you, Sarah and Aaron. Um, so we've gone through a bunch already. We know a lot of really cool stuff about HPV vaccine and the HPV virus itself. We know that it's super common. We know that it causes cancer. It's not just a female virus or a female cancer. Um, and we know it's effective. It's great when we have something that prevents cancer. It works. Um, but we want to, of course, know is it safe? Is this OK to be giving our children? So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the safety aspect of this. So how many people, it's kind of small on here, but there's a headline here that says, Wisconsin mom, did HPV kill my 12-year-old daughter? This was about a year ago. Can I, just by show of hands, who saw this headline or heard about this? Yeah, so definitely more than half of you. I know people heard it because they called our clinic. We talked about it a lot. Now by show of hands again, who saw the follow-up to this? So this was at least three weeks later and it was pretty hard to find. Did anybody see the follow-up to this? So maybe two of you. So this is, this is an example of part of the problem we're seeing here. Media has done a great job of sensationalizing stories. Um, people want to hear stories. People don't want to read, you know, look at all these graphs we're showing you and, and talk about the science. They want to hear stories. They pull up the heartstrings. They, it's an, they're awful tragedies. But what gets lost then is the medical piece. So we do a lot of cleanup in our medical office. And, um, and it's time consuming. Um, but we want to make sure that people are hearing the right information from us. So media is not the place to do that. Um, as we talk about vaccines, they are actually the most highly regulated thing in medicine. More highly regulated than any prescription medication you take, any over-the-counter medication you take, far more than any supplement that you take. Those aren't regulated at all. So we have tons of data on this. When people say, oh, I don't think it's been around long enough, I like to tell them this. Um, it's amazing the vaccine approval process is actually quite, quite intense. Um, this is just a diagram here that talks about the steps that takes place um, before a vaccine has gone to market. So this first step here, the vaccine is developed, it has to be approved and manufactured. This whole process takes generally more than 10 to 15 years. So the very first piece here is everything that happens behind the scenes in a lab doesn't involve people. Several years, the vaccines are, um, before it's ever even given to people, extensive lab testing is done. The next step is, um, are what we call clinical trials, where it actually involves people. Now, we don't bring kids right into this. Usually, they're adult volunteers. Um, and we start with this phase one trial. It involves a small amount of people. But the goal looks at, is this safe? Should we even bother testing this? Um, what happens if things pass through this phase? It goes through phase two, phase three, and gradually, we involve more and more people. Um, by phase three, we're talking about thousands and thousands of people that are part of the study. So this is before your pediatrician even recommends the vaccine to you. So as in, the, in the case of HPV vaccine, thousands and thousands of girls um, and then boys took part in these studies. The whole goal of all this, because as you can imagine, this is an enormous process. It's a very expensive process and involves a lot of people, girls coming in for every six month pap smears. The whole point is, is it safe and is it effective? And that's really what the FDA is looking at. So the FDA will actually license the vaccine only if it's safe and effective, and do the benefits of giving it outweigh the risks. So that's that first step. And this, again, takes another five to 10 years. It's a very intense process. This is just an example of some of the things that we were looking at in the HPV um, vaccine clinical trials. Um, this table shows adverse events that people reported, that women reported, um, within two weeks of receiving the vaccine. And as you see here, people reported a whole bunch of stuff, fever, nausea, common cold, dizziness, diarrhea, vomiting, body aches, headaches, toothaches got on there, uh, nasal congestion, difficulty sleeping. So all the symptoms here that people reported are on the left. The middle column, those are the people who actually got the vaccine. And again, over 5,000 people in this initial study. And then placebo, those are the people that did not receive the vaccine, but they got a saline injection. They don't know which one they got, they reported symptoms. And it's fascinating. The numbers are exactly the same. The next thing, whenever, we, whenever we're giving an, uh, um, an immunization, that mounts, or you're, you're looking for an antibody response, involves the immune system. So it's common practice to actually look at autoimmune disorders as part of a vaccine clinical trial. By giving a vaccine, are we inducing autoimmune disease into our population? Um, again, oops, what did I do? Here we go. Um, the conditions 
all autoimmune related are lifted, listed on the left. And again, in the middle column, those are people who got the vaccine. On the right, those are people who got the placebo. And again, granted, these numbers are very small. We're not seeing a ton of autoimmune disease. But again, there was no difference between the placebo group and the autoimmune group. So as you see, people who got the vaccine, guess what? 1% of them developed an autoimmune arthritis. They could say, oh gosh, was that due to my vaccine? Interestingly though, the same exact number of kids who did not get the vaccine got arthritis as well. So that's just an example of the importance of having a control group or a placebo group. Events happen. So after that whole process takes place many, many years, go by. Then what happens is before it comes into your doctor's office, we have to approve it. Um, what happens is a big group of people get together um, on a national level, medical care providers, public health folks, and basically they look over everything again. That whole process um, is reviewed in detail. If this big group called the ACIP recommends it, goes back to the CDC, they have to, they have to reapprove it. So New vaccine, if everybody approves, this is a good thing, then it becomes part of our US immunization schedule. And that's when it comes to your doctor's office as a recommendation, usually by me or other pediatricians. So that's not all though. So now we have this, we have this vaccine. It's been very well studied. By the time it's licensed, it's really not new anymore. It's new to you as a parent or a, or a provider, but it's not new in the research world. So this last step here, is ongoing. So since 2006 for the HPV vaccine, we are constantly, constantly, constantly watching for any adverse outcomes. And there are many, many, many groups that do this. There's actually three in the United States. So there's not just one group looking at adverse events. There are three distinct groups, all made up of different people, both academic centers, private healthcare plans, and the CDC and the FDA that are looking for any adverse events. Now, if they see any pattern whatsoever, there's huge red flags and things get studied in more depth. I'm gonna talk just a little bit more about this top one here called VAERS, or the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. That's the one people are most familiar with because if you ever, you know, you always have to take the handout about the vaccine after we give it. A lot of those go right to the trash, but on the back of every single one of those, it has this contact information for VAERS because we want people to report any adverse symptoms that they may be having, whether it's related to the vaccine or not. That's how we know, is this causing problems? So that um, there's basically, again, it's, it's a vaccine safety program. The CDC and the FDA actually run this. It's their job to make sure the products they're providing are safe. Um, about 10 million vaccines are given every year. And of those 10 million vaccines, there are about 10 to 20,000 reports per year. So some limitations to this, um, it's, a good, it's a good system. It's identified lots of problems. For instance, a good example is the rotavirus vaccine, which we used uh, many years back. It was causing an intestinal problem in infants. As soon as there was a pattern there, they pulled it immediately. And that was actually done pretty quickly. They redid this. Um, we have a brand new vaccine now, I should say brand new, brand new to the public. Um, and with a really great safety profile. So they actually look at this, they're, tr they're trying to prevent harm. It's a real thing. Limitations of this though is guess what? Anybody can report it. You can report it, the, um, your kid's grandma can report it, um, their teacher can report it, we as providers can report it. So reports do not equal people affected. If there's a kid affected, we could submit five reports all from different people. So that's just kind of an interesting limitation to this study. The other limitation is there's no placebo group. So we're saying, oh gosh, you know, this many people who got this vaccine had this side effect, but in this particular study, there's no placebo group. So we don't know how many people in the normal population would have got, gotten that problem. So that's interesting. They have to kind of sort through all that information. So I'm gonna give you that VAERS data on the HPV vaccine. So since it was licensed in June, 2006, we um, stepped back and looked at data over almost a nine year period, so from last March. At that point in time, there were 67 million doses of HPV given in the United States. Um, now we're much higher than that, because that was already a year and a half ago. But 25,000 reports were made to VAERS. Now I know that sounds like a lot. When you consider 67 million doses, that's 0.003% of the people who received the vaccine had an adverse event. So very small number. Well, what do, you, what do we mean by event? We basically break it down into three groups. Was it non-serious? Did it cause some very short-lived symptoms that self-resolved? 
Was it serious? Did it cause any long-term disability, cause hospitalization, cause repeated medical visits, or did it cause death? Those are three areas that we look at. Now, we talked about that being a pretty small number. For those of you in, who can do some mental math, 92% of that number was, was reported as non-serious. So non-serious, kids had some dizziness in the office, they were a little nauseous afterwards, they had headache, maybe they got a fever, some of them had fainting. All things that we saw in the clinical trial. So there was no surprise here that 92% of this small group of people did have report some adverse events. Interestingly, when we look at serious events, people that either got admitted to the hospital or have had kind of long-term problems, 8% of those events, again, out of this small number, 8% were considered serious. And interestingly, the serious, the serious events are not death, they're not autoimmune disease, they're not big medical problems, it's some nausea and vomiting that maybe landed them in the hospital for some IV fluids, it's maybe some prolonged fever, headaches. So that's 8% of the, of the reports were these serious events. The death one always comes up, of course, we don't want to be giving anything that could, of course, um, cause anything like that. 96 deaths were reported around the timing that those patients got their HPV vaccine. Um, interestingly, they were only able to locate death information on 47 of those patients, meaning there was no documentation anywhere about anybody else. So it makes you question the validity of those reports. But of the 47, they found medical records, health reports, coroner records. None of them were linked to the vaccine. So this is actually really great. This is actually the, one of the most safe vaccines we have. There are a couple other vaccines where if you have an underlying seizure disorder, you could get a bad seizure and potentially die. So when we think about this, HPV is the safest one we've got. And this is where people are falling short here. So one other thing in terms of safety that I just want to bring up, because it comes up a lot, especially in our community, a lot of people ask about premature ovarian failure. Will this vaccine affect my fertility level? Um, I heard about, I've heard these stories about people who have gotten premature ovarian failure after getting their HPV vaccine. So this is an interesting question. Um, and it's of course been very widely looked at because guess what, of these, 90, uh, of these 67 million doses given, nine people have reported premature ovarian failure. So nine of the 67 million. But that was enough to really look into this. And there has been no pattern, no exposure, nothing that links HPV vaccination to this which is interesting because if you were to read the media, it paints a very different picture. So that's just something I want people to, to know that this vaccine has nothing to do with that. It's a complex medical disorder that's usually a combination of genetic and environmental and related to autoimmunity, potentially triggered by certain severe viral infections. HPV vaccine does not cause fertility problems. So that brings us to, we know that it's safe, we know that it's effective, why on earth aren't people getting it? We, have a, we should be shouting from the rooftops that we have a vaccine that prevents cancer. And not just a small number of cancers, 5% of cancer we see in the United States. We put a ton of money into cancer treatment. We're not doing as much with cancer prevention. And this is a huge and easy one. So, how many kids really aren't getting it? Is it really all that bad? We're gonna check that out. So this is US rates. So these are female adolescents, 35% of U.S. female adolescents are getting all three doses. Not bad. We've actually already seen some decline in HPV-related disease, so it's doing something. This is one vaccine where we see the opposite of what we usually do. We're more, you're more likely to get vac vaccinated if you're a minority. Hispanic population is most likely to get vaccinated. And if you're below the poverty level, you're more likely to get the vaccine. So food for thought. This is the Wisconsin data. I just want to share with you here that the, between 2010 and 2013, the Wisconsin data, we're not doing really any better. We're still at about 35%, just like the rest of the United States. We've done a little bit better with men. So we were essentially going from zero to about 10% of boys have received all three doses. Interesting thing is, it's not that we're missing these kids. It's not that they're not coming into clinic. We're seeing them. They're getting their other vaccines. They're getting Tdap tetanus, pertussis, which is whooping cough, 90% of kids are getting that. 80% of kids are getting their meningitis vaccine. So it's not that we're not seeing them. That means they're coming into our office, they're getting vaccines, and leaving without the HPV vaccine. We have done a huge disservice to our patients. So we thought we'd look into this at UW Health. 
We are an academic institution. We practice evidence-based medicine. We're progressive. We have to be doing a little bit better, right? Not what we found. We're at about 40% among the UW Health Clinics. So there are some that were actually doing okay when we first started looking at this last spring, but some down in the 13, 16%. So we recognize that we had a lot of work to do. So that's where Sarah and Aaron and myself come in. We've got this big immunization task force and our goal is to provide education. And we'll talk about a couple barriers just briefly, but there's clearly we've got work to do here. This is my favorite slide of all because it shows where do we rank? How are we doing compared to other places? So there's a country here that's close to 100% immunization rates. Can anybody read which country that is? Rwanda, a country this big in the middle of Africa. They, have near, they are about 100%, very close to 100% for immunizing all of their females against HPV virus. Now, the message there is simple. It prevents cancer. They're not focused on the things we're worried about here. They're focused on the cancer message. Because guess what? Cervical cancer is the leading cancer in females in Rwanda. So their message, they're, they're, they're doing it right. That was fascinating when I saw that. Now, a country that maybe we're a little bit more similar to, Australia, let's look at them. They're at about 80%. So about 80% of Australian females, teenagers, are, um, are immunized against this. And actually, they're doing pretty great with our guys, too. Their boys, about 70% of them are, uh, are immunized. They have seen tremendous decreases in cervical, uh, re excuse me, um, HPV-related disease already. It's a little bit early yet because remember that cancer takes about 10 to 20 years to form, but we're seeing a tremendous decrease in HPV-related disease. So as we look here, and these are only a few of the countries, as we look here, our poor vaccination rates, this is a United States problem. We're the only ones who are saying no. So over 2 million doses given worldwide, 67 million doses here. We're just not immunizing our kids. So our task force kind of started to look at this. We'd, we were trying to decide what is the problem here. Now, there have been lots of studies on why this is the case. It really comes down to education. People are not hearing the right things. People think, it's, people think that, um, that the message is, should be surrounding ser um, sexual activity. Um, people are really worried about the moral aspect of it, potentially giving a sexually transmitted disease vaccine. Is it gonna induce sexual activity at an earlier age? Why are we giving it to these young children? So it really comes down to education. We found that when we went out to our groups, a lot of the providers didn't know this information. Now, medical information changes rapidly. If you look at where we started in 2006 to where we are today, we know so much more. It's a problem among girls and guys, different types of cancer. We found that when we went out to educate our providers that this was new information to them. We had eyes looking at us like this. They couldn't wait to go tell their patients. Um, and I can't tell you how many parents have been so appreciative of a conversation. No one's told me this before. I had no idea. I always thought we gave it to boys to protect the girls, so on and so forth. So it really comes down to lack of both parent provider education, parent hesitation, and then of course that media role that I talked about, sensationalism. So basically, current recommendations. We recommend right now that we vaccinate between ages 11 and 12. Now this may be changing. You saw those immune studies that Sarah pointed out. The highest, re the highest antibody rate is nine and 10. Since the vaccine is approved, a lot of us are giving it at nine. But that big, huge US um, immunization task force is still recommending 11 to 12 in both boys and girls. So I always tell people I've got children. My son's gonna be nine in March. He's a boy. He's gonna get his HPV vaccine. He's gonna get it at nine. Sex won't even be on the table. This is the cancer prevention. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, I think Nicholas was gonna say a word and then we'll be open to questions. So thanks to our speakers, of course. Yeah. And uh, the message is simple. We have a few minutes. Uh, we started a little bit late, so we have a few minutes left for uh, question and answer. So if the speakers all wanted to step up here and you can decide amongst yourselves who's best to uh, answer each question, and um, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and come around. Yeah. Um, I, my question is, you talked about the different doses. Can you just say like, about what ages? So if you were to give your son the first dose at nine, when would they receive other doses? Sure. So it's a three-dose series, just like many vaccines um, require multiple doses to mount the proper immune response. Um, 
So it's given over a six month period. So you get your first dose on time zero, second dose at two months, third dose at six months. So it's given over a six month period. What we found in terms of, of course, barriers, one of the barriers is getting them in for three shots. So that's tricky. So a lot of us are working on a logistical level to get people back in for the rest of their shots. That's a great question. So the public health department is the main place um, where you can get free vaccines. Now one thing that's important to know, any vaccine that's recommended, that U.S. immunization schedule that I was talking about that you've probably seen hanging up in your doctor's office, anyone with private insurance, those are 100% covered. Any child who is underinsured or has no insurance, they're covered under the, a couple social programs. So there is really nobody who should um, not be able to get this vaccine essentially. That's mine. Um, so, you know, we, we know so much more now about um, the progression of HPV and that progression to precancer and cancer. Um, and, and we know that essentially in the past we were probably over treating people because there are a large number of those people with low grade abnormal PAPs, with low grade dysplasia, um, that it's just, it's gonna, it is gonna go away and not progress to cancer. Um, so the, the idea is that we, we don't want to over-treat and end up causing problems when, it, when it's probably just going to go away on its own. So when this was sort of this normal mm -hmm. half test, you just said, you said three normal yep. tests is done. Are you over 65? No. No, I, yeah, I didn't. No. Um, so you should still be getting them up until age 65. So, no, so every three to five years until age 65. No. Yeah, yeah. Where's my where's my payout is what I want to know. This is volunteers. Are you seeing Cub Scouts and dance yeah. and, and orthodontics appointments? Yeah. We feel very passionate about yeah. this about this subject. So that's a great question. I wish that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? 